Good evening. good evening. It's good to see you all here. I don't know, are we able to be online, Mike? Yeah, we're, online. we're online, so we welcome those who are worshiping with us at home. Just a word, if you feel comfortable receiving ashes, and no one needs to receive ashes either way, but if you feel comfortable receiving them from me, then you'll come forward. If not, we have little packets in the back that have a little vial of ashes in them with a little bit of oil in it. So if, you'd like, if you feel more comfortable not having me touch your forehead, that's okay. I will not be offended. But we're glad to have everyone here tonight. We're going to have a little bit of interaction during the... This is not going to be a sermon. We're going to have a conversation, so you get to talk back. How many times do you get to talk back to the preacher? Some of you do all the time, John, I know. But uh, I invite you now to prepare your hearts and minds as we enter the season of Lent and as we worship together with our voluntary. Amen. I invite you now to join in our introit. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. you as you're able and willing to stand for the call to worship. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is, he is gracious, gracious and merciful, merciful slow, slow to, to anger, anger and, and abounding in steadfast, steadfast love. love and relents from punishing. Now the hymn is Sunday's Palms or Wednesday's Ashes.
be seated. Jerry's going to read for us now from Psalm 51, the first 17 verses. This is David's psalm of contrition and pouring out his heart to God after the prophet Nathan confronts him after his adultery with Bathsheba. David's heart belonged to God. Even when he went astray, he would return to God and pour out his feelings, pour out his remorse, trusting in God's grace. So these are the words you're going to listen to now. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You did desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wind, wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. The Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 6 and 16 to 21. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal, like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consumes and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever heard the expression of a grand gesture? Or sometimes a grand romantic gesture? Anybody here ever tried to pull off a grand gesture or a grand romantic gesture? You have to talk back tonight, you gotta answer me. These are not rhetorical questions. 
Are you all embarrassed to say your grand romantic gestures? John, go for it. Flowers and a bed and breakfast. Gail, have you ever seen flowers at a bed and breakfast? Uh, I haven't seen flowers, and I can see the bed and breakfast. <laughs> okay, but not together. But that seems pretty grand. Anybody else have a grand gesture that you've tried or that you'd like to try? I tried with my husband, who was a very meat and potatoes kind of guy, to do a grand gesture. Our second anniversary, because our first anniversary fell on Good Friday. Yeah, that's fun. But our second anniversary, I had it all planned. I went online, do, 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 and I found this perfect lodge. And I heard the phrase for the first time, read the first phrase, luxury cabin. No such thing as luxury cabin. Luxury glamping. No, 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 no. I paid more money for one night in this little lodge than I'd ever paid for a hotel in my life. And it wasn't until they sent me the confirmation that I saw the dreaded words in bold type. It said, in order to keep the ambiance of nature, there are no televisions. And that's when I knew I was a dead woman. Because West Virginia University was playing in the final basketball thing. And it was basketball final season time. And I was a dead woman walking. <laughs> then we get there. Now, it was not all that luxurious. The bathroom was downstairs. and bedroom was upstairs. You got to keep in mind, I didn't get married until I was 42 and my husband was 48. So by this time, he was 50, I was 44. We needed the bathroom at night. So my husband was also six, four and a half. So when I heard the thunk followed by the ugh, because we were sleeping under eaves that were very close to the bed. That was my last grand gesture. For his 50th birthday, which happened a couple months later, I said, I've cooked you a special dinner. He literally said, Jesus, help me. And then I told him no, because the table was set with our wedding china and crystal and silver. And I gave him a fried bologna sandwich on cheap white bread with onion and mustard. He was a happy man then. Grand romantic gestures are meant to do what? Impress. What else are they meant to do? Show your love for someone. That's what I was hoping for. It did not... I said to my husband after it was over, I said, do you love me? He said, I must. <laughs> so sometimes they backfire, don't they? Write this all down, Nathan, because you haven't been married long enough to know all these mistakes. Yeah. Um, nobody else here has tried a romantic gesture or a grand gesture of any kind? Well, a couple of years later, after several other failed attempts at anniversary, our anniversary always just something went wrong. Every time we tried to plan something, it just sort of fizzled. I said something to a friend of mine. I was sort of complaining about it, a little whiny. And I said, you know, I just can't have a good anniversary no matter what I do. And she said to me something that has always stuck with me. She said, but you have a good marriage. She said, my husband does big things for me all the time, and I have a lousy marriage. Ended up not being married very long because he was addicted to gambling and made her lose her home and told her one day when she said, it's me or the slot machines, he said, I'd rather play the slots. It's hard, isn't it, to want to do the right thing and not do the right thing? And Jesus is telling us here, God is not interested in grand gestures because to make a big show of something doesn't necessarily mean it's true, does it? So where, where do you see in the passages we read, both in David and also in Matthew? Matthew 6, if you don't remember where that comes from, that's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has called his disciples. He's been tempted in the wilderness. He calls his disciples. He takes them up the hillside. A crowd follows, and he teaches them the basics of what they need to be a dis disciple. And what does he say? Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. What's a grand gesture of piety? What's piety? You all know what piety is? Don't smoke, don't drink, don't fool around, don't cuss, don't, you know, it's your personal behavior, your personal ethical system. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a personal ethical system because if the world had more personal ethical systems, we'd be in a better place right now. Amen to that. Amen. But by the same token, if you're practicing piety, if you're doing these things to check off things on a list, is that pleasing to God? Jesus says, no, no especially if it's to be seen by others. 
When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They stand in the streets and on the synagogues so they may be seen. When you give alms, what is alms giving? It's a special type of giving. It's not just giving to the church. What is alms giving? Hmm? It's giving specifically to the poor, which is one of the, the Lenten disciplines, to give alms, to fast, to pray. All the things that Jesus says here, but to do them in, in the privacy of your own heart, not to be seen by others. I love the way the Amish pray. We were doing a study of the book Amish Grace two years ago when everything just sort of went out the window with the COVID pandemic. Amish Grace, what they do when they pray, they don't pray aloud. The only thing they'll pray aloud is what? The Lord's Prayer. It's the first prayer they teach their children, first in German and then later in English. They teach them to fold their hands and bow their heads when they're little tiny things by sitting them on their lap and putting their arms around and folding and praying with them every day. The Lord's Prayer is prayed out loud. They never pray any other prayer out loud. You know why? They don't want to sound like they're trying to be flowery and ornate. They're trying to do what Jesus says here. When you fast, don't look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. <sighs> Anybody give up anything for Lent this year? You don't have to tell me, because then you're like, I'm not going to raise my hand because she's going to call me a hypocrite if I do. The trouble with giving things up for Lent is sometimes when we give things up for Lent, it becomes about us, not about Jesus and what he's given up. Bill Brown, some of you know Bill Brown. Most of you know Bill Brown. I think all of you know Bill Brown, don't you? He used to serve here. He did the Daniel Fast. Anybody ever done the Daniel Fast? It is a very, very rigid vegan fast. You can't have anything fermented, which means no mustard, no cider vinegar, no nothing. He lost weight when he did the Daniel fast. I gained six pounds. I didn't enjoy a meal for 40 days or 40 nights, and I gained six pounds. And I couldn't give up coffee. I made it 45 minutes into Ash Wednesday without coffee. My head was pounding, and I said, Jesus, I know you died for my sins, but i got to serve these people. And so I had one cup of coffee a day, and Bill said, you're cheating. I hear that a lot when people give up things for Lent. You're cheating if you eat on Sunday. If you give up chocolate for Lent, you have one on Sunday. Give thanks to God. It's always a celebration of the resurrection because that's why we say these are the Sundays in Lent, not Sundays of Lent. Because Sunday is always about Jesus Christ's resurrection from the dead. It's always about his power. It's always about his triumph over all those things. So if you gave up ice cream, go have a Sunday this Sunday. Have to. No. And then the one that's the hardest, I think, don't store up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, what does that mean to store up treasure in heaven? You gotta think out loud here, folks. You know, it's all right to say something and then not be sure and say, I take it back or whatever. We can, we can, this is what a conversation is, right? What's an earthly treasure? Let's start there. That's easy, right? What's, what's some of our earthly treasure? Automobiles. Money. Clothing. What else? What was that? Sports. Oh, amen. What else can be a treasure here? Anything that takes your attention away from the real things in life is a treasure. So how do you store up treasure in heaven? Serve others. Really serve others. Out of your heart, not just out of your obligation. Don't make it something you have to check off, that almsgiving thing. We're going to have a passion-driven Lent this year. We're going to have a passion-driven Easter this year. Not Now, I did a... a Word search of the Bible and passion. Passion in the Bible is not a good thing. Because, you know, you always God destroys people out of the passion of his fury and things like that. No, 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 no. But we're going to talk about what's important to us. What is in our hearts? What leads us on? What is it that gives us life? And I hope for you it's Jesus Christ. We've had a lot of Lent this year, haven't we? The last, we've had the 40 days, the 40 nights. We've had the two years of Lent, it seems like. We're coming back. We're coming to Easter. I want you, during this season of Lent, to look into your own hearts. I want you to ask yourself, where is my treasure? Where, 
where am I putting my heart? Where is, where is my effort going? Where is my energy being spent? And if it's on things that are too temporal, that are here, some people, it's their political views. They're going to fight till the death on those things. For other people, it's holding on to power. We're seeing that happening, playing out in the world now between Russia and Ukraine. Because Vladimir Putin has all the money he could ever want to spend, but he needs power. Power is so addictive, isn't it? It doesn't have to be world domination. It can be power in your own home, over your own family. That's something that I've seen a lot in my ministry. Power used unkindly toward others, especially those we're called to love. Now, I hope this Lent will find you not giving things up. It's all right. I mean, I, I try during Lent to be, I live a more simple life. Eat more simply. Be more aware of my surroundings and the money that I spend and the gas that I use and things like that. That's okay. I'm not, and if you give up ice cream, if it helps you feel close to Christ, give it up. But take something up for Lent. Take something up. Take up almsgiving. Take up prayer every day. Pray the Lord's Prayer every day. It will bring you closer to God, I promise you that, if you are aware of that every day. Begin your day with thanksgiving and praise. Sing, whether it's in the shower, in the car, or around the table before you eat dinner together. Sing your praise to God. Even if... I, I love what goes on between these mother and daughter groups here. When they, we say something like, we either have a singer or somebody who doesn't want to be heard. But my favorite part of Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We've lost so much joy. It's time to reclaim the joy that is ours in Christ. Joy doesn't have anything to do with happiness. Happiness has to do with what's going on around you right now. A lot of us have had a lot of things happen to us that don't make us happy. Amen to that? But joy cannot be touched because joy is eternal. It's from God. So I hope your, part of your treasure is the joy that you have in God's presence, the joy that you have in knowing what Jesus Christ loved you enough to do for your sake, for the sake of the world. I can't remember who said it. I meant to look it up. But one of my favorite expressions is some people are so focused on heaven, they are no earthly good. Don't go there either. Don't just be so talking about Jesus all the time because that becomes its own form of idolatry, doesn't it? If you're not going to live it, if you're not going to examine your heart, you're going to miss out so much. I do hope that this Lent will be a Lent that gives you time to contemplate. Contrition is a good thing. Contrition is feeling sorry for something you've done. It's that uh-oh moment. It's that being convicted of your sin. Don't stop with contrition. What is repentance? Turning and going the other direction. <clears throat> Knowing that you're going toward a God whose arms are outstretched to you in love and grace and mercy and peace, willing to embrace you. God can love you past any brokenness you've ever experienced. God can heal any hurt that you've ever had. God can raise you up from the lowest depths that you will ever experience. All this is grace given to us. But don't take it for granted. Give back to God during this season of Lent. Find someone who needs your love. I always say the people who are the hardest to love are the people who need to be loved the hardest. Think about that a minute. People who are the hardest to love are the people who need to be loved the hardest, aren't they? Love someone with the love of Jesus Christ. Love them as much as you can. Pray for others. Give what you have away. Not your car. Not your prized possessions unless they need to be given away. But Jesus doesn't look for the grand gesture. It's not the size of the check. It's the heart behind it. Give your heart to someone during this season, and you will be in a different place this Easter. I promise you that. Easter and Lent always come to us in different ways, don't they? It's the same story every year. 
but where we are when we hear it is different. The first time you hold your newborn baby and you hear the story of Easter, it's going to hit you differently than the first time you sit in church without your spouse or your mom. The promise is the same, but we all need it at different times and different places. Remind each other of the promises of God. In a few moments, I'm going to invite you, if you're willing, to come up and receive ashes. These are not our ashes because we realized late in the game that we didn't have any palms to burn last year because nobody was here to have Palm Sunday. We ordered these online. Did you know you can get ashes from Amazon now? <laughs> They're a sign of mortality because we are drawn from the carbon of the earth. God's life is breathed into us. We share it with one another. We from generation to generation, but we return to dust one day. This is a symbol of our mortality, but may it also be a symbol of our penance, that for the things we've done that have broken God's heart, we are truly sorry. We read the words that I love from our call to worship that comes from the Hebrew scriptures. Rend your heart and not your clothing. You know where that comes from, right? When Jews in the Old Testament and even into the New Testament were really, really outraged or, or brokenhearted, what they do? They tore their... Imagine that sound of tearing cloth. That's a grand gesture that you don't have to make. God wants your heart to be broken. Not to be broken beyond repair, but to be broken with the needs of others with the concerns of others. So as you enter this Lent, as you receive the sign of the cross on your forehead with the words, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Commit yourself to a life of prayer. Commit yourself to a life of self-giving love, following the example of Jesus. The world needs us, Epworth. The world needs us, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. The world needs us, children of God. The world needs us. May we give ourselves away during this holy season of Lent to find ourselves on Easter morning, restored, redeemed, renewed, resurrected, looking to the resurrection that is to come through Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, from the dust of the earth you created us. May these ashes be for us the sign of our mortality and penitence and a reminder that only by your gracious gift are we given eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I will remind you that if you don't feel safe coming forward to receive ashes, there are little packets in the back that have a vial of ashes in them. But if you're feeling safe coming forward, I will put my mask up and come forward and receive the sign of ashes. <laughs>
to remain from dust and the dust you shall return. Remember that you are made from dust and the dust you shall return. Remember that you are made from dust and the dust you shall return. Remember that you are made from dust and the dust you shall return. Remember that you are made from dust and the dust you shall return. Remember that you are made from dust and the dust you shall return. The table of grace is the place where God invites us. Regardless of our sin, regardless of our brokenness, regardless of our stubbornness, we're still invited. I am always struck by the fact that Jesus knew full well the disciples were about to deny him, desert him, and betray him. And then he says to them, here is my body for you. Here is my blood. So Christ calls us to his table now. He calls those who love him best. He calls those who barely know him. He calls those who have a stirring in their heart that might be God calling. Even John Wesley, as much as he was a Methodist, as he was methodical about everything he did, believed that grace would come to you at the table, and so all are welcome. All are welcome. This is God's meal offered to us in grace. But before we come to the table, we're called by Scripture to confess our sins and to honestly, genuinely, and truly forgive each other from the depths of our hearts. So I invite you now to join me as we pray. Holy God, your self-giving love is revealed to us most clearly on the cross. Help us through these holy days of Lent to examine our hearts and discern your will for our lives, that our devotion may be genuine. May our actions reveal our love to you enacted in the love we show to others in the holy name of Jesus, the treasure that we seek above all else. Please take some time this evening to remember the depth of God's love for you in Jesus Christ. To confess the brokenness that's in you so that you may make room for his grace. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now, as safely as you can from a distance, would you share with each other signs of Christ's love and peace? The peace of the Lord be with you. One of the names for Holy Communion is the Eucharist, meaning Thanksgiving. The great Thanksgiving is the time we remember all that God has done, how God created us from the dust of the earth, breathed the Spirit into us, and gave us life. God gave us everything we could ever hope for or want or need or possibly imagine, and yet it wasn't enough, was it? 
we were stubborn. We sought our own way. We wanted to be more like God, and so our love failed, but God's love could not fail. God sent us the law through Moses, not to restrict us, not to hurt us, but to help us to live in a right relationship with God and with each other, because so many of those commandments are about how we treat others. Still, our love failed. God sent us prophets like Elijah and Isaiah and Jeremiah to try to get us back on track, and still our love failed, but God's love did not fail. And in the fullness of time, God's word became flesh, and Jesus Christ dwelt among us full of grace and truth, and in him we found life. On the night before he died, on the night before he died for our sins and the sins of the world, in the company of those he knew and loved the best, he took bread. He gave thanks to God and broke the bread. And he shared it with them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. After supper, our Lord took the cup, again gave thanks to God his Father in heaven, and shared it with those whom he loved, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves to God and to each other as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Would you hold your communion elements up, please? Holy God, send the power of your spirit upon these gifts of bread and cup that they may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Send the power of your Holy Spirit to touch the heart of each one of us who gathers in his name that we might become for the world Christ's own body, redeemed by your blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one in communion with all your saints, one in giving alms from the generosity and spirit of our hearts, one in prayer for the world, for each other, for ourselves, for your will, for your kingdom to come one in holy living until he comes again as he's promised and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And as our Lord Christ taught us, so now we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ willingly allowed his body to be broken on the cross so that we might be made whole through him. Christ shed his blood on the cross so that through him we might know abundant life, forgiveness of sins, and life eternal in the world to come. The body and blood of Christ are given to us. Eat with a glad and grateful heart. Amen. Let us pray. We have been fed with your mercy and nourished by your grace. Instill in us the desire to invite others to share in all that we have received from your loving hand, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. I invite you as you're able and willing to stand and sing together number 269 from the United Methodist Hymnal, Lord, who throughout these 40 days.
may know I talk about my husband a lot because he is with me in my heart every day and I'm coming up on what would have been my 22nd wedding anniversary. Two times in 16 years of marriage our anniversary fell on Good Friday. So what happens when you marry a Baptist who says lunch meant I don't want to wait another month. Now a couple years in I said aren't you sorry you said that? He's like mm, I don't know. But our last anniversary fell on Good Friday. I said to him I'll make it up to you next year and there wasn't the a next year. Take every opportunity you have to show love. To show love to each other in your families, but to show love to God's children throughout the world. The world needs us right now to pray, to pray for peace, to work for peace, to work for justice, to work for the righteousness of God to rain down. I pray every day throughout the day for Vladimir Putin. I'm telling you, I make myself pray for him. That God would reveal himself to Vladimir Putin like to Paul on the road to Damascus. Because what else is going to change a heart other than the grace and the mercy of a savior? He doesn't know he has one. He's got one. But look at all the people that you see every day who don't know they have a savior. Let them know that they do. Let them know that they're loved. Let them know that their sins can be forgiven and their brokenness be healed. Their broken hearts can be healed. Because that's what Jesus came to do, to heal our broken hearts, to bind up our wounds, to lead us to righteousness in God. We're on our way to Easter, people. Are we not? Don't we all need some Easter? Y'all ready for some Easter? Then go out and share Easter. Live Easter now. Examine your hearts. Do all the good Lenten stuff that you're supposed to do to get closer to God, but never forget that this is about Easter. Go into this night with that as your promise, your hope, your peace, your love, your joy, your blessing, and the blessings of God Almighty, who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen. Let us sing together one last time. shining within us. Lord, your light drives darkness away. Lord, your light is guiding us on, preparing us for the coming Easter day.